Today I am talking to Professor Greg Downey, who is legendary in the field of martial arts studies. Most people will know his book on learning capoeira, but if you look at his uh, Macquarie University website, it'll blow your mind the things that, that he's working on around neuroanthropology. So we'll talk about a few of those things today. Greg, good to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, well, I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm okay. I'm really excited to chat about, because um, this is the first time I've sat down and read your your website, all the things that you are into, neuroanthropology, martial arts, learning, sensory development, skill development, evolutionary anthropology, so many things that are, are so relevant to, to martial arts studies and also just just the human body and the, the, you know human growth Absolutely. and civilization development. So mm. where should we begin? I mean, we, we sh let's talk about, um, we'll talk capoeira first and then move on. Okay. From there. So, so sure. the, the book that probably most viewers and listeners will be aware of is your uh, Learning Capoeira book. Um, tell mm. us the story of how, how you got into that. I mean, what was the, what was the idea behind it? Ooh, um, well, my interest in capoeira actually came, uh, at university I met somebody who knew a bit about capoeira I was doing um, an Okinawan style of karate at the time. And so my first interest in capoeira had nothing to do with the academic side of things. Um, I finished up an undergraduate degree in anthropology. I was looking to go to graduate school to do a master's and PhD. I had a semester off because I had sort of jammed up all my courses into three and a half semesters. And I thought when I applied to graduate school, I was going to be studying um, Haitian Vodun or Haitian religion. But in that one semester break, I went to the library local, like I was at St. Louis, I think it was a Washington University library or one of those libraries. And I looked at the shelf on Cap on um, Haitian Vodun and it was like three meters long. You know, it was like so many books on Haitian Vodun. I was like, holy, you know, I can't do a PhD on something like that. I'm, I'm not smart enough for that. So I thought, well, what am I gonna do my thesis on? You know, and I was interested in African diaspora culture. And I remember Capoeira, and it turned out there wasn't a lot of stuff published on it. Mm. So I thought, oh, I'll check this out, you know, and, and they were actually right as I got ready to do my, um, go away and do my field work, this is like 1993, uh, somebody sent me, one of the editors at University of Chicago Press sent me the pages for Lowell Lewis's book, which came up before mine. Um, and he, his book on Capoeira, I think was published in 1993 or 1994. And so I kind of went into Capoeira research because this is going to sound really lame, but um, Haitian Vodun research was scary, super scary. They were super smart anthropologists working in religion and the anthropology of dance and embodiment and stuff like that, by contrast, seemed really underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. Sport, dance, especially Capoeira was underdeveloped. And so I went into it feeling intimidated by the kind of corpus of work and the intellectual work being done in religion. But in the process, it was kind of a beneficial thing because the embodied nature, you know, the profoundly physical nature of martial arts forces us to deal with certain kinds of questions that I probably could have avoided had I just gone and worked in Haiti and, and done Vodun research. And besides, you know, I had friends who went to Haiti and it was really, it was intense and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, field work in brazil man that was that was pretty awesome so <laughs> spending spending two years in salvador you know doing capoeira with these old guys that was that was pretty amazing so that was that was my phd when i talk about it people say oh what a racket and i'm like hey, amen it was a racket you know to get um a foundation to pay for me to spend two years in brazil doing capoeira and hanging out with people who were musicians and folklorists it was pretty ideal yeah, yeah. so that's that's kind of how i got into it I think you've just identified anyone who's not an anthropologist who knows a little bit about anthropology. That's their number one thing. It's like, what you call this work? Exactly. You're yeah. for two years, and and <laughs> you think that you're doing work, and everyone's yeah, no, it's, jealous. Actually, <laughs> even the people who were doing capoeira in Brazil were jealous because they all had real jobs, you know. And here I was, like, this was my job. So. I would show up at every single event. They were like, what are you doing? You know, like everywhere we go, all over the city, you're there. Yeah. Because that was exactly what I did 24 seven. You know, if I wasn't like going to the grocery store or like, you know, sleeping off a hard day's workout, I was pretty much headed for the gym or I was going to talk with some old fella who had amazing stories or I was going to the archives. Mm -hmm. um, it was really like, I don't think people realize that kind of field work 
it's not just that you go and study something exotic. It's that you devote yourself completely to it. Mm-hmm. And, and you just get, I mean, it's like if you took, you know, I mean, people, lots of people who do martial arts do that. They kind of go on pilgrimage, you know, to Japan, to do Aikido or something like that. And you just, the learning that goes on when you're doing it that intensively is mm-hmm. remarkable. You know, when you're doing something and you're thinking it, you're sleeping it, you're breathing it, you're, you know, it occupies your whole, you know, your whole daily schedule. Yeah. I think that that for me is just, it's a remarkable opportunity. So that's kind of how I got involved. Came back, wrote up a dissertation on it. I was still doing Capoeira. Um, I eventually got a postdoc in New York City. I went and did two years in New York City on a postdoc, which also allowed me to study with Mr. Jean Grangi in New York City, who's one of the legends of sort of Capoeira Angola. Mm-hmm. And then um, eventually finished up the book on it, which was based on the dissertation, but like a lot of people, my dissertation was really undercooked and I really felt like it needed a bit more mm-hmm. uh, sophistication, refinement, and then became a book. So yeah, that's where that came from. And one of, one of the big things that um, practitioners or, or performance ethnographers or, or people who want to, to, to study the act of learning something physical and embodied, one of the problems that we, they all encounter is how you get that from your knowledge in your body to the words on the page to communicate to uh, a, a reader who mightn't have the faintest idea. And I remember th- there's a line or a, a section in your book where you're, you're working on the handstand. You just can't get the handstand. You can't get it. And, and people just keep saying, just just stand up. Like you put your hands on the ground and then you just, and you like, it doesn't mean anything to you. And then you say, one day you just stood up and, uh, uh, and, and you had it. And I, I mean, as a reader, like I, 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 you know, I can, I can maybe do a handstand. I can't do capoeira. So like, I mean, I had a great idea the other day. I thought I'll go down on my punch bag and do something different. I thought I'll do some, I'll put my hands down and do some kicks that way. And I've never done that. And I was like, I tried it twice and thought, yeah, well, maybe another day, okay. But like, I mean, where, so even a reader like me who, who trains something martial arts at least six days a week, to me, it's just like, what do you mean just stand up? Like, well, yeah. where does that leave us in terms of communicating embodied skill and embodied knowledge in that way? Well, I think for me, I had to come to a kind of compromise where I wasn't actually going to communicate the skill in the book. You know, this isn't a book on how to do Capoeira. In some ways, it's a book of like wise things that veteran practitioners told me about how they distilled some of the lessons of the art. You know, some of the lessons that were a bit broader. I think... If somebody wants to learn capoeira, there's only one way. Mm. You got to do it, you know. But if somebody wants to sit down and read something that was written by somebody who was devoting their time to the art, who sat at the feet of real experts. I'm, I'm not a real expert, but I sat at the. F- I played in the hodas and I and I learned berimbau from some of the real masters and some of the things that they told me. That's really what's there. And and to me, I think. I don't want to encompass the art on the page. I want to put something on the page that when people read, first of all, they feel like they know the art better, even if they don't do it, but especially if they do the art, they feel like they understand it more deeply. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's a, I think the book, you know, it's an academic book. So it's, it's wonky, it's full of jargon. It's, you know, got all the failings, but I hope that if people do it and they read it, they feel like they understand the practice a bit more deeply. Mm -hmm. because that's all I did. It's not my insights. It's insights I've stolen, you know, off of all the people who taught me and the people who sat down and said, you're doing this wrong, or, you know, you're never going to get this right if you don't understand this point. Mm -hmm. So for me, the book is almost like a separate conversation about that art. And it's all about, I mean, the subtitle is about lessons lessons in cunning. I mean, Mm -hmm. for you, that there's something, it's not just it's not just the, the, the physicality and the acrobatics of it. I mean, so for instance, one thing I was thinking was during lockdown, my newsfeed in, in my social media has been full of mm-hmm. adverts for things like learn how to do this mobility stuff, learn how to do this. Mm-hmm. I mean, even stuff that's trying to make Qigong look like kind of really sexy and physical. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's, it's not yoga, but they're trying. So like, there's a lot of capoeira type stuff, like join this, sign up for this online capoeira thing and learn how to do these amazing physical things. But in your mm. subtitle, it's lessons in cunning, isn't it? 
Yeah. So you can't get that from an online course. I'm, I'm... No, you you really can't. And and I mean, there's there's different theories of this, even amongst practitioners. You know, some of the practitioners are really focused on the movement, and they say, you know, like I've had I had practitioners tell me, you know, Capoeira is is only movement. That is all it is. And anybody who tries to make it more complicated, philosophical, spiritual, they're crazy. And I also had other people say, no, 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 the movements, you could never, you could be an, an old guy with a you know bad back and bad knees and you can't do any of the move, movements and you can still do capoeira because capoeira is that, you know, that cunning, that malicia that comes from it. And so the most, the most, for them, the most perfect capoeira strike might not actually be look like a strike at all because it's so deceptive and so cunning you know that you you move a piece of furniture into somebody's way as they're trying to set you up to hurt you you know or you you don't go down a, a, a an alley that somebody's waiting for you that's perfect capoeira for them because mm. capoeira the 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 movements are just the um exercises to teach you to be a different kind of person a mm. cunning person somebody who will not be caught unaware somebody who will not be deceived Mm -hmm. And so for them, that's, I think, I, I, that's one of the things I thought I could distill from it. You know, if you're just interested in doing handstands, you probably shouldn't be reading a book. Okay. You know, but if, <laughs> but if you really want to sort of say, like, what makes Capoeira different from other martial arts, then maybe that book can help. You know, that's... So, so, what, what, so let's say, for example, um, if we distill it into something, into terms that people might be able to get if they haven't done Capoeira. So mm. if I'm a boxer, there's really four punches, okay? But mm -hmm. like, um, and, and it's movement and, and footwork and, and, and punches. But the best boxers can hit you really slowly. And you just, because is that cunning different? Like, so like a brilliant, uh, someone who's brilliant with their hands can actually just do in quite a slow way and, mm. and, and hit you. And you, you, you just, because they knew what they were going to trick. They maybe didn't even know it consciously. They just knew it's like a faint when, when you, people are moving and they'll throw it at exactly the right time. They didn't necessarily know, they didn't plan. Mm. It, there's a cunning there that's an embodied knowledge. Is, that, is the capoeira cunning different or is it more advanced or a different flavor? I think it's, I think it's because, because capoeira privileges play and theater so much. It's, it's very playful, it's very funny. Some of the most cunning things that happen are, are really funny. Like, they're, they're, they've got a kind of rough humor to them. They're, they're completely unexpected. And so if anything, I think one of the reasons why Capoeira is so acrobatic is because it really removes a lot of the driving, you know, pragmatism of boxing or the driving pragmatism Muay Thai or something like that, where, you know, there's only so much stuff you can do because a lot of stuff is really a bad idea given yeah. the, what the other person is doing. Whereas in Capoeira, you sort of like, I'm going to give you space to do a wider variety of things, but I'm also going to give you space to get yourself in a wider variety of trouble. Yeah, you know, and I'm going to let I'm going to give you space to do a cartwheel because there's going to be opportunities that get generated there, mm -hmm. and I'm going to see if I can close those down on you. Mm -hmm. And if you're really good, then when you start in a capoeira, you don't have to finish. The movement is not, you know, you can change directions. You can you can convert that into something else. And so I'm you and I are, are giving each other a bit more latitude. I think I think that's one way to understand Capoeira because there's a kind of playful dimension to it mm -hmm. and a theatrical dimension. You don't have that driving pragmatism. I mean, you can get you can play against people who are super rough and you can play a very hard game. Mm -hmm. But because you're trying to provoke each other, there's you give each other a lot of latitude. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they give each other uh, there's certain versions of the sport which I'm not as in, much into where they give each other so much latitude that you're actually outside of effective range of each other yeah. that's a form of capoeira which I'm not as intrigued by where mm -hmm. it's super fast super acrobatic but also you know you're two or three meters distance from each other yeah. Yeah. so even if your timing is absolutely terrible you're still not going to hit them yeah the Angola style we're in each other's spaces but we're going slow and we're not you know, we're not just grabbing the other guy. We want to see what unrolls. We want to give it a little space and time. Yeah. Okay. So you say roles, and and that leads me to, I guess we could talk about your research around things like MMA and different martial arts. You've you've yeah, written yeah. About pain and um, and reality in in uh, in things like MMA. So tell us a bit about that. So did you move? Was this an academic interest that was led by your physical interest or did you just go I'm interested in that intellectually I'm going to look at that intellectually you know it's one of the I don't know how your academic choices are but when I look at mine uh, frequently I have to reconstruct whatever happened how did I even get there 
you know, I think when I came back from Brazil in 1995 and I said I was doing Capoeira, everybody said, oh, you're doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I was like, what the hell is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? You know, like, I don't even know what this is. Cause like in 1994 is when the UFC really broke in the US mm -hmm. and it instantly among martial artists, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu became like, what is this? And here I was coming back from Brazil doing Brazilian martial arts and everybody assumed I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I didn't. So I was teaching Capoeira and, and playing Capoeira until I guess about 1999, I was just like, all right, I got to try this thing. You know, like I got to try this because I was into MMA too, watching it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'll be honest with you, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is like, it's rough. I'm, I'm, you, maybe you've done it. Well, have you done it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, that was my latest thing before the pandemic hit. So it's like, you know, I was in the honeymoon period. So, yeah. Yeah, it's rough, man. Like it, it's a workout. Like, you know, it's like a throw up, you know scrape off your knees like it's a workout you know you smell like the bottom of a locker by the time you finish and you know you've had somebody's ass in your face excuse me <laughs> bottom in your face like way too much it's a rough workout and um that was kind of a, maybe it's a bit masochistic but i kind of got into that <laughs> like i really like the intensity of it and so i did it for i did it for a few years um did it for a couple years then i've been, i've had to bounce around a lot with jobs and moving and stuff like that and um, i was never any good at it uh, you know, I was, I was always getting like, I think I was in my mid thirties before I even tried it. So I was always getting wailed on by some younger fella who like had way more energy than me. And, <laughs> and um, so, but I was really fascinated by, I guess I was fascinated by how much technique was involved mm -hmm. and how much I watched some really good, you know, purple belts and things like that, just surf on bigger, stronger fighters and just, you know, just use technique, roll with them, and just again and again, submit them again and again, get them in a bad position. And I just found that really fascinating. That, you know, we, we talk about how certain kinds of sports are like a chess game, yeah. but Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is really like that because when you take out the strikes, yeah. it's, it's, and you, and you introduce the possibility of submission, it sort of has all of the, the physicality of wrestling, but mm -hmm. layers of complexity in it. So I really got interested in it. And then, um, I started writing people, I, I don't even know how I started writing about MMA, but I started going to local promotions in Indiana. So I go to these like fights where there's 500 spectators or 2000 spectators and some, you know, um, small <sighs> conference center where people would be drinking too much. And, you know, the fighters, all that was at stake was like a $200 prize and a belt that somebody had made at a trophy shop. Mm -hmm. And I started interviewing guys who were doing this and, and women who were doing it. And, I was really um, impressed by the dedication and the meaning, how important it was to them. You know, they were, I remember one guy who, who was in a, he was in, he had to fight two fights in a night because there was a little tournament. And the first fight he almost got beat up, but he managed to sort of gut, he gutted it through the whole thing. Second fight, he, he kicked this guy. He was getting beaten pretty badly and he kicked this guy and must've dislocated the other guy's knee. And so, cause the guy just went down in a pile and he was celebrating, but at the same time, he was very worried about the guy he had just knocked down and sort of dislocated his knee. And the guy who was on the ground was rolling around in pain, but he was, he was pointing at this other fighter saying, you know, you're the man, you're the man, like you, you kicked my butt. <laughs> and at that moment I was like, wow. And I talked to him afterwards. I interviewed him and he said, you know, I change, I change oil in cars for a living. And my girlfriend left me and my brother and I work out in my backyard and this is the greatest night of my life. This mm -hmm. is the greatest night of my life. You know, that this was so significant. And I think that that, that respect for the, the challenge, uh, mm -hmm. we, 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 we promote sports in children. We promote sports in professionals. But what about all the folks who continue to find meaning in these things mm -hmm. beyond 16 or 18 years of age? In the United States, we're terrible at that. I'm in Australia now, but I was in the U.S. then. In Australia, they're much better. Sporting life continues beyond that. Mm -hmm. But I was just impressed by the commitment and, and what it must have meant to that, that man and other guys like him. So, yeah. yeah. Use, the word, use the word change there. And I guess this is where we could talk about our interest in <clears throat> looking at different aspects of intense or extreme sports from a uh, from an experimental perspective and you, you write on your website and I haven't read it's one of those things it's a real revelation you think you know someone you think you know their work and then you look at their website and go what he's also done what 
He's like as if he wasn't busy enough writing about <laughs> martial arts. Or he's also been doing all this other stuff about different forms of of learning and change. So, um, so the neuro in neuroanthropology and the mm. issue of of evolutionary. I mean, how does how does this fit into your kind of you know humanistic kind of um, face to face embodied and kind of where does where does neuro come into learning something like capoeira or MMA or or, or something? I mean, what, what does that kind of research look like? Yeah, look, the neuro stuff was actually, I was brought to the doorstep of neurology by martial arts and by physical training because people made claims in the training that were only plausible if you believe that they could change how they function neurologically. Mm -hmm. So capoeiristas would say to me, oh, it modifies the way we see, it modifies our balance. It changes the way we have emotions. The Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys would say the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Recently, I've been working with free divers. I've been working with um, blind, uh, vision impaired individuals who echolocate. They click and they can hear space. And I wrote about this stuff from a very humanist perspective for a long time. Just, you know, the capoeiristas say that this modifies their bodies. And I remember finishing the book draft and I was like, what if they're right? Mm. You know, what if they're right? And there was a lot of research in anthropology on embodiment. And it was, for me, mostly, it's a lot of metaphor. It's not really, it doesn't really try to, to ask biological questions. So gender is embodied or, you know, social disadvantage is embodied. Well, what does that mean? Where? Which tissue? You know, which system is it affecting? And so the obvious one is, is neurology. And I started just to pick up some basic stuff on sports neuroscience and find out that, yes, in fact, athletes are neurologically, empirically, in an empirically testable way, they are different. That if you're a midfielder and you play football, uh, association football, soccer, mm -hmm. you have a different visual perception sensitivity in your peripheral vision. And you can track more moving objects. If you are, you know, a cricket batter or a baseball batter, you have distinctive eye tracking patterns on the pitcher or the bowler, mm -hmm. and you pick up information faster. And if we shut off your vision during the test, you can do it in a way that other people can't. So there's kind of a psycho neuro reality to the claims. And that's what I started to kind of get into. Like, okay, if these Capoeira guys say they can change their balance, is it plausible? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I'm less interested in doing brain scans. I don't really want to do brain scans. Um, I don't have that kind of money. I don't have that kind of equipment. Um, but I think I want to test some of these claims. Are they plausible? Does it make sense? And if they made sense, what would be affected by it? Mm -hmm. What's a plausible story I can tell that's consistent with what we know about how these systems work that goes beyond just saying, oh, it changes your body. It's so different. Well, how so? If you're going to say yoga changes somebody emotionally, how would that work? Mm -hmm. What would what would it look like? If you're going to say that, you know, boxing is good for kids who have problems with self-control, why? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Is it just sociological, you know, social and, and interactional? Is it psychological and perceptual? Or is it even, does it affect their endocrine systems? Does it affect the way that they respond with stress hormones? Mm -hmm. And some of these things, I was just listening to a talk by Wim Hof. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's making these kind of claims and he's just like, yes, it changes you this way and it changes. And I'm like a little bit more. Let's let's ease up to these things. You know, some of them we can't really test. You know, I can't really do a brain scan on somebody while they do a cartwheel. Yeah. So I'm going to be a little bit more humble in the claims I make because I don't really know for sure. But some of these things that people say are plausible. So you're kind of triangulating between this different data to say, here's what I think is a plausible story for how this works. Yeah. No, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, um, I've always felt that I've always, I've always experienced. So, you know, things like I, um, I, I practiced Eskrima for maybe mm -hmm. five, 10 years or something. And I, I noticed that my flinch reflex was getting really dangerous. <laughs> Interesting. Want, I wanted to stop that because, like you know, you can't you can't be turning to murder someone just <laughs> your wife tickles you or your child drops something behind you. So uh, that caused yeah. me a huge amount of stress. So so I switched to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and that changed and it and and I felt it change me. 
yeah. physically, energy, psychology, my outlook on life. But then when the lockdown started, I was suffering terrible, terrible anxiety. And I read about Wim Hof and I tried it and it turned my anxiety off. Like my yeah. anxiety was constantly running all the time. All, and from day one of that breathing stuff and cold showers, just switched off. It's off. And it's, it's astonishing. I mean, I mean, like yourself, I don't know about these claims. I don't know about this, but, but I know that different practices, different skill sets change your perception, change your relationship with the physical world. And it, it, it's, so we're, we're very plastic kind of beings, aren't we? I mean, we're- Abs Absolutely. Uh, Paul, those are great. Those are all great examples. Those are exactly the kinds of things that I think something like a neuroanthropology can try to get a hold of, you know, what, and, and I don't, I don't doubt Wim Hof's method. I'm actually doing a lot of stuff myself with breathing right now. I'm doing a lot of breath holds on the exhale. Mm -hmm. So exhaling and then holding breath without my lungs full, which is a technique that a lot of freedivers use, but also a lot of folks who do different kinds of contemplative traditions. I just, I just think that we have to be you know, we're putting forward hypotheticals. We're not putting forward, like, I haven't tapped into some ancestral thing that science had no idea and I'm proving that this, you know, like, I just think it's like, whoa, I'm, I'm not in the business of selling. Um, I'm not, I don't have to sell anything. So, so yeah, no, I think it really works. I think practices change your footing. There's no doubt about it. You know, sports have these kinds of holistic effects which are not just positive thinking or they build, you know, the, the story we tell is it builds confidence. You know, that's like, a, it's a pretty lame story. And it, it can't be true that every sport works on confidence or whatever that is in the same way. You know, a scream is gonna affect you differently than Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is gonna affect you differently than meditation or extreme breath holds. And so, although some of those same factors might be in play, you know, there might be some, I am more of a, I'm a systems theorist, so I don't, I, I believe that there's, that a human is composed of lots of different subsystems. Mm -hmm. And sometimes physical activity tweaks consistently the same subsystems, but there might be something like a screamer, which tweaks just one system that may be Brazilian, like for example, the fast twitch reflex, you know, that, that kind of thing. It, so there's a kind of way in which when we look at something like a martial art or a, or a whole body tradition, I think we have to get really careful and detailed because there's a lot of difference between, I do, I do a lot of tango dancing now and tango dancing changes my relationship to my body. And one of the things I've had to learn is how to be, is how my own tension, which I hold from a lot of sport comes through my body into my partner and how I have to learn to force myself to relax my muscle tone mm. to allow my partner to relax. Because if I'm, you know, in a Brazilian jiu-jitsu kind of shoulders locked down, upper arms ready, it's going to just come right through my body into my partner. And so I actually can, it's for, it's almost like, you know, tango is a martial art, um, but it, 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 it makes sense. Well, I mean, I, in my, when I used to do a, a lot of Tai Chi and I used to go to classes regularly and teach classes and all the rest of it, if people came in there was one day some people came in who were advanced tango they were friends of friends and they were tango people and they could do push hands they could just do it <laughs> because in push hands you listen you stick you yeah. yield and and that and tango is all about i mean i've never done tango so i, I don't know but they were just the whole body straight away they could read yeah. my body uh, and they could go well if i push that bit if i twist that bit slightly it was amazing amazing stuff and, and i think i think that's something too where you get these kinds of weird transfers, but there's also a way in which I think one of the things that's nice about mixed martial arts is it's taught us that there is wisdom in a lot of different martial arts. Each, each one of them oftentimes has something different to teach us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so for a mixed martial artist, it's Muay Thai and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a bit of Greco Roman, you know, they get a bit of the, but they also have things to teach us about like our self-control, our posture, uh, different emotions we want to develop. I mean, one of the things that Cap would have developed in me, I would argue, is is my sense of being a showman. You know, my my confidence to present myself as a bit of a clown and put myself out. That Cap would have helped me to realize who I was going to be. And I think all intensive practices, you know, they they do this in different ways. I mean, you learn stoicism from distance running, or from you know, and you learn different. You learn self control from cutting weight for wrestling. There's lots of things that we can learn, and and I. Maybe that's maybe that's one of the things that, that sort of lessons in cunning subtitle references is there's lessons in being human from a lot of these arts. Mm -hmm. And as an anthropologist, I really want to tap into that. 
mm-hmm. and share it. And I don't have an interest in arguing that one is superior to the other. They're different. And maybe at one stage of my life, one of them makes a lot of sense. And then five years later, something else makes sense because of who I am, but also who I want to be and what I want to develop. So, yeah. yeah. So you, but if we, if we put that, that, that individual body and that individual psyche into the material world. So when we, like, I met you in, uh, in Trier a year or so ago in a conference and you gave a paper about, yeah. that was kind of connecting ideas of, uh, of evolution and, and change with material mm. conditions. And you did, you spent a lot of time discussing the, the kind of the, the Eurocentric kind of idea that the fist is the natural degree <laughs> of fighting. And you kind of problematized that by going, you know, look at all the other different traditions of different fists and, and, and so on. And, and, and you talked about the way the boxing glove reinforces the idea of the fist as natural or universal or, or dominant mm. or superior. And so you talked about the way that the material environment of a martial arts training or sporting arena has biological implications for the for the sort of lifetime evolution of a of a, say a fighter like the a, a fighter's biography would a uh, physical um, uh, physicality would completely change depending on the material context of their, uh, mm. of their training so tell us a little bit about this kind of line of research well, this is this is something that was sort of a criticism I had of, of mixed martial arts. It was the idea that that was sort of like no rules, and so therefore you'd see, you know, truth would win out. Whose martial art is the most effective? And what I noticed is actually there's a lot of rules, and they're quite subtle. And some of them aren't rules like you can't do stuff. They're rules like gloves should be this number of ounces, or you are not allowed to reinforce this part of the, you know, the, you cannot wear shoes or like, and, and when you start to, like when you do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, one of the first things you learn is, is, is gi and no gi is very different and extremely different technique. And what you can do when you've got a gi on and what you, what you do when, you, when you're sort of got bare skin, you, the properties of the skin and the clothing change how you apply things and what you can hold on to and, and what's your grasping strength. And so what I realize is, is we don't really notice how these minimal technologies get factored into in very subtle ways, the way that we train and the way we do, you know, the, the, the construction of a running shoe changes your gait mm-hmm. if you wear a running shoe. Our bodies are so adaptable that they pull information off of these minimalist technologies. So for example, if you're fighting in a ring, it's different than if you're fighting on a cobblestone street with broken bottles. If, you know, if, um, yeah, just all, if I'm wearing my glasses, I, I fight differently than if I'm not wearing my glasses. Mm-hmm. And so I think that when I started to look at that, what I realized is what was happening in mixed martial arts was something quite subtle. Mm-hmm. A group of people together were changing, were, sort of running fights, studying them, modifying the way that they would fight, changing the rules, modifying how they fought in this kind of rapid evolution. So you go from a kind of completely unpredictable martial art in 1994 to fairly predictable fights. I mean, they're fun, but they're stabilized. And that stabilization shows that in a sense, the people doing it have as a community worked out what can work. And as a community, they've taken certain things off the table because they don't like the consequences. So headbutting gets taken off the table because they don't like the consequences. The consequences are, you know, not just that you know, like you need <laughs> you need dental care. Um, the, the the consequences are also like American politicians freak out and ban the sport mm-hmm. because they think it looks ugly symbolically. Mm-hmm. You know, and Capoeira headbutts are totally fine. Kepwet is, you're not allowed to punch, but headbutting is considered to be artistic because it takes a lot of finesse to get close enough to somebody to headbutt them. So, and you know, like uh, there's a lot of, and I talked about the aesthetics of it, how there's actually a kind of aesthetics. What, what is compelling violence and what is ugly or boring violence? And in mixed martial arts, one of the clearest things is you got to be able to break up wrestling mm-hmm. because if you're really good at something like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and you don't have time limits on the rounds and you not have a ref who's going to stand you up, those fights can grind to an absolute standstill. Mm-hmm. And the, the managers and promoters realize this is terrible for the sport. And so you get this kind of weird way in which they're tinkering with the rules and it looks like they're just trying to keep people safe, yeah. but they're actually trying to, to yeah. shift 
yeah the whole to equation it, to make it spectacular to make it to make it watchable it's i guess it's there's an argument so aren't there about how do you make boxing safer and the obvious answer is you don't let them wear any gloves i mean if you yeah. like if you face a heavy bag or an aqua bag and you don't have any gloves you're oh god do it twice and then you're going to be doing a lot of elbow and knee training so if <laughs> not going to do headshots if you haven't you're not going to be punching people repeatedly in the head if you have no gloves i mean that, that was yeah. the reason for the invention of the, the gloves they called them mufflers didn't they where and it was really to protect yeah. knuckles it was nothing to do with somebody's head it was to do with it, knuckles it was even more so apparently the first guy the first heavyweight champion who required that he would only fight with with the gloves on did it because he knew that his technique allowed him to fight over and over and over again if he wore gloves. So he could actually make more money. He could have a fight a week because he would just shred these less technically proficient boxers. In the in the MMA, in the UFC, the, the famous example of this was the first person to wear gloves in the ring was a guy named Tank Abbott, who was a famous sort of barroom brawling style fighter. And he said, I know that when I punch you, my hand is going to blow up. Yeah. You know, I'm if I hit you as hard as I can in the forehead, I'm going to break the bones in my hand. So I'm going to tape them, yeah. bind them, and, and then I can throw my punches. And so, again, it, it's a really once you get into the studying of the technique and the technology and the material, you realize that like little things like that matter enormously for what's possible with the human body. You know, whether I have a, a gi on or not matters enormously in terms of what I can escape from, what kind of chokes are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, can I get my arms free and out of things, whether I'm wearing a glove or not? Uh, so to me, those, it, it's kind of like looking at, at fighting and realizing there's kind of a science going on there. Yeah, it, it looks like brutality, but it's actually a lot of science going on. Uh, people are studying what's happening. Why did this fight result this way? Where is that technique coming from? Is it effective? You know, and then some people are thinking, about how can we get rid of it? Other people are thinking about how can we exploit it? And, and so that's, to me, it's not so much evolution like, um, it's evolution thinking about how does how do humans solve problems together mm -hmm. is one of the things that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, I remember, so I, I guess a takeaway kind of meta point from this would be that if we if we do if we're as academics if we're scholars and we care about things like embodiment embodied skill and and what it mm. what it is to learn something what it is that we're learning that we really going to have to be as we're going to have to be open to as many different ways of of testing and verifying and exploring these things rather than just settling on words like it's embodied skill as a kind of way to not think it further you say like what is if we look into that and we explode that out what does that actually mean biologically psychologically in, in material terms scientific terms or is, as many vocabularies as possible really yeah there i think you're right i think that if you know from the humanistic side of things my my side as a just an anthropologist is interested in culture embodiment is kind of like pointing to the boundary of what's possible and I don't want to, at the same time, I also don't want to say like, oh, sports science is the truth because I've run into sports scientists who have no idea what's going on. You know, they just think like um, they don't realize how much variation is happening, for example, you know, that that um, when you're looking at a martial art, you're looking usually at a community with really different streams of tradition, really different forms of training. Um, it's very hard to say that there's anything like a, one single Muay Thai. That there's actually like multiple different you've got to get in there and listen to people and and watch fights with them to understand these different sorts of techniques so i think for me as a scholar i mean it's an interest in variation you know it's that interest in like i'm not even convinced that you can give people i think you give two people the same exact training mm -hmm. and it's going to affect them differently mm -hmm. like if, if you and I go into the dojo together and we work on one set of techniques, you're going to do it differently than me because you're going to solve basic problems that we're not even talking about in fundamentally different ways. Maybe because we're bodies are different, our flexibility is different, musculature, I'm afraid of certain things, you're not, you're, you're transposing some movement from a different martial art into that. I don't have that background. So mm -hmm. even when it looks the same from the outside, I'm not sure that people are doing it the same on the inside. And mm -hmm. Part of what makes it exciting is to really like slow down the video, study carefully, mm -hmm. sit down. One of the things I love doing is like taking some video stuff and, and then watching it with people who know stuff, who know more than me, <laughs> yeah. and just seeing what they see. Yeah. And 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 like we're, I'm doing some work right now with some, a student who's working on Muay Thai. 
And it's so interesting to watch fights with her um, and to see what she sees because I don't see, I don't know how to watch it. Yeah. She's been in the ring. She knows what she can see. And, and, and I think, so that's, that's where the, the, the kind of cultural side comes in is there's a lot of knowledge and wisdom in the communities. Mm -hmm. They're not a hundred percent right in some sort of empirically testable way. Sometimes they say stuff that's crazy, mm -hmm. you know? And, and one of the things I have to ask is like, are they saying crazy stuff because it makes sense if you do it? In which case, that's interesting. Are they saying crazy stuff because it's what they heard from their, you know, their mestre, their, their mm -hmm. sensei, whatever, you know, their, their teacher? Or are they saying crazy stuff because they're trying to figure it out themselves? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's all exciting. You know, it, people can, I, I, that's one of the things I think I'm a little bit different as most anthropologists is I think my informants can be wrong. <laughs> you know, like, and that's a really weird place to be at. Like, I know what you're telling me. I know you believe it. I think it's wrong. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you believe it, but I don't have to just transcribe what you're telling me. And that's the final word. Yeah, I think I think that's what makes me both a good and a bad student of martial arts because I've had so many different instructors. I mm. find myself, if I'm training alone on a bag or something like that, there's a constant conversation in my head going, but my instructor, and I was like, but, that, but that's not right. But yeah. For me, that doesn't work. And for surely it's more complicated. <laughs> yeah, you can't do, you can't do a roundhouse that way. You know, the pivot <laughs> leg isn't right, but it's right on this guy. You know, no, it's, I think, and again, we, our bodies are different and the, and the moments are different. And I think that, um, you know, so much of this stuff gets turned into, I mean, it's what the UFC was so interesting. It, it, a lot of martial arts were, were very much straitjacketed by doctrines and, you know, has to be done this way. You know, this high prestige practitioner has said, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you got to do it this way. And when you throw it all in the ring, what you find out is that actually people, even the best do it differently. You know, even the very best solve the same problems in totally different, in totally different ways. And that's exciting, mm -hmm. you know, that my body doesn't work quite like yours and my body doesn't work like it worked five years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm continually... Uh, and this is not just as a researcher, but as a practitioner, you know, I'm continually like trying new stuff. And one side doesn't work like the other side. Like why, yeah. why can I always land that kick with my left leg, but my right leg, it's completely at a gamble. Like it might land it, it might not. It just, and, and why and does this work against one, one training partner it doesn't work against the other training partner? Yeah. You know, I'm really good at this usually. What are you doing that's stuffing me up? Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. And I mean, the same thing with tango, you know, one partner, I feel like I'm, you know, perfect at this i'm fluent and the next partner i feel like uh, you know i've got some sort of seizure disorder that's stopping me and and i, I think that that's that is one of the things that our bodies are not i don't I'm, they're not euclidean objects mm. you know they're not perfect they always reproduce the same motions when i do a handstand in capoeira some days it just feels different some days my body responds to my desire to do a handstand differently mm -hmm. and so what the skill then is is the skill is being able to create something consistent in spite of the instability mm -hmm. in spite of all that variation you know like mm -hmm. if i can just do the handstand one way i don't do it very well mm -hmm. but if i can do the handstand on a day i'm exhausted if i can do a handstand on a day i'm over i can do a handstand when i'm you know have done 10 handstands in the last minute then i'm really getting somewhere mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that kept what a training taught me is, is push yourself, not just because you get better, like you need more exercise, push yourself because you find different sorts of ways of solving the same problems. Mm, different sorts of ways. So finally, I guess, I mean, is, what should we look out for next for, uh, for people who are interested in maybe either the, 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 the pedagogical or the, the scientific approach to embodied learning, embodied skill, what's in the pipeline, any books or lectures or... Like yeah, that. look, I got a bunch of stuff in the pipeline. I've got a really cool project I'm doing right now with the student looking at um, the relationship between cornermen and fighters, which is really exciting for. Um, but then I'm also working on a book with my longtime collaborator, Daniel Lendy, who I did the neuroanthropology blog with. And I'm putting in a bunch of chapters on different physical practices that I think are really important because they show how the body can be encultured. So talking about um, capoeira, but also talking about free diving talking about some of the, the perception among the vision impaired, the blind, um, and some other stuff on language and how language can actually change the way our attention works and the way that we, so it's really, it's an attempt to write a book on brain culture relations and pull up a lot of cool case studies that um, he's doing some work on trauma survivors and people with different sorts of um, addictions. And we're trying to put together some case studies that show the human nervous system is 
subject to a lot of um, shaping, sculpting by culture and parts of it that we don't always think of as being modifiable or plastic are actually plastic. You know, so that's one of the reasons I love free diving. I mean, breathing seems to be the most automatic thing we do. Mm -hmm. And yet you can modify how you breathe tremendously. Mm -hmm. And what you find is that when you modify how you breathe, it has all these other things, like you were talking about with the, you know, with the Wim Hof method, like mm -hmm. turns out that breathing, instead of being this automatized kind of boring system is actually a kind of handle on all these other automatic systems. If you can get a hold of it through the breath, you can modify them. You can change the way they operate. And so far from being a boring automatized system, it's actually a doorway into all kinds of practice that affect endocrine system, other sorts of automatic parts of your body and how to think about, you know, and then of course, as an anthropologist, it's cool because I'm not the person who's discovering this. This has been discovered multiple times in multiple different traditions that the breathe, I had a, I had a, teacher, a freediving teacher tell me, you know, breath is the glue. It holds the whole system together. So if you can change the breathing, you change how the whole system works. And, and that's such an interesting way to think about, like, yeah. how do we modify ourselves? It is. It's, it's hugely interesting to me in lot, not just for selfish reasons, but I mean, my, um, my daughter has terrible issues with mood regulation and stuff. And recently mm. I've, been, I've, I've kind of just cut out all of the psychology, all of the therapy. I'm just like, right, we're gonna do three breaths together now, big. Yeah. We're just gonna do three. And then we're gonna get back to this. I don't wanna do a Wim Hof thing here, but like just come, you yeah, know. Yeah. And it's, it, it's like you say, it's a handle. It's just like she, it does something. It's like a reset switch. She just go, okay, now I can think again rather than just be in some kind of primitive panic brain situation. Yeah. It's, it's astonishing stuff, which and I mean, it's, it's I central to so many martial traditions as well, isn't it? I mean, it's the breath. It's, it's, it's Absolutely. I mean, I think breathing, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I sort of clicked into it as soon as I heard somebody talking about it is every martial arts tradition says breath is key. Now they do it differently. Capoeira does it very differently than say, for example, you know, a, a hard form of karate or something, you know, you've got, but, realizing that humans are discovering that through their breathing, they can influence their perceptions, their consciousness, their awareness, their anxiety, the way, the, the ability to produce force and to absorb force, um, their speed of their body, their reactions, all this can be modulated through breath. And so as an anthropologist who's interested in that kind of biology culture interface, this is clearly like a front line mm -hmm. and folks are finding multiple different ways to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of go find an extreme example. People hold their breath, you know, six minutes, seven minutes, up to one case, um, 13 minutes, you know, of breath hold. And you realize, wow, you know, there's way more latitude for modification than we realize. Yeah. And we're still learning that. I think that's, that's the other thing too, is we are still learning what's possible with the human body. And a lot of the evidence is out there. We're just not used to listening to the people who know it. You know, they're, they're in remote parts of the world. They're in traditions that don't write it up in magazines or put it on ESPN, you know, that we need to think who's out there, who's exploring what's possible with the human body and nervous system. Mm. And um, yeah. Fantastic. Well, Greg, um, thank you for staying up late for this work. Uh, and, uh, my pleasure. Allowing I'm, I'm glad. me to speak at a civilized hour for me rather than getting <laughs> up in the middle of the night. So it's been absolutely fascinating and, and really great to talk to you again. So thank you very I'm much. I'm so glad that you invited me, Paul. I'm just so glad to get a chance to come on. And, and you know, I, I love what you do with this stuff. And We could talk and, about uh, this all the time. So I think we could <laughs> where we just chat about all of these things. This would be, this would, this would be a, a wonderful kind of career development for me. <laughs> What's your uh, job? To Greg I'm, 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 I love it. I learned from, I mean, I've learned so much about martial arts research from you too. And I, I don't have your depth of breadth in the, in the field. So it's, it's interesting to bring some of these theoretical concepts to you and see where you take them because you bring up examples that I never, never would occur to me, but that's, I mean, being an anthropologist, it happens all the time. You know, everybody has bits of wisdom and experiences that can help us. And, you know, science is important. Even if you feel like you're an authority, even to get a PhD, to shut up and listen to what somebody else has to say. So thank you for the chance to, to, to learn. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Thanks a lot.